Bigani First Nation was originally called the Pagan Indian Reserves. They were created after Treaty No. 7 was negotiated between Canada and the Blackfoot Confederacy in 1877. These lands were surveyed in 1880 based on a formula of one square mile for every five people. That was the same year the Bigani conducted the last buffalo hunt. Life had always depended on mobility, but they would never again follow the old lifestyle. Instead, the Pagan Indian Reserves, number 147 and 147B would be their permanent home and farming would be the new way of life. They would cut timber in the Porcupine Hills and use the logs to construct their village. While the Bigani people were familiar with cultivating plants, they only grew tobacco for ceremonies. When they settled on the reserves, farming and ranching replaced mobile customs, and a village with churches, schools, and administrative offices became the center of their community. Although everything about reserve life was new, they did bring many customs from the old days into their cabins. However, there was no one recording the thoughts and impressions that people had about the changes occurring around them. 130 years have passed since the Bigani first settled on their reserve, and many questions have remained unanswered. How do modern Bigani experience their history? How do they relate to those early days of reserve life? What knowledge remains about that time? These are some of the questions that historical archaeology can answer. This documentary revisits several research projects undertaken by archaeologists from Simon Fraser University who examined the early reserve era by excavating an old Bigani farmstead, a residential school site, and the community's timber limit. The result provides a picture of the early days on the reserve and memories that endure to the present. This project I hope to uh, kind of uh, put people on uh, Give people some idea about their about their community and what what's been going on here uh, for the last hundred years or so. You know how the community has changed, how the village has changed. Kind of discovered through my own archival research that uh, Rocket was established in 1897. I was in graduate school in 1997, and during my uh, archival research, I discovered that. Uh, Brockett was, uh, in fact, upon celebrating its centennial, and, and this was something that nobody really knew about in the village. Nobody really uh, knew that they'd passed this milestone. And so I, that was why I started thinking to myself, well, i got to really do something about this. i got to make people aware that they've got this you know, rich history. The old agency, which had already become established shortly after the reserve was uh, surveyed and people started settling here, the administrative center was on the northeast part of the reserve. But then once the uh, Canadian Pacific Railway was built through the reserve in 1885, one of the whistle stops along the uh, tracks was uh, the station of Brockett. And Brockett soon became the hub, the hub of the local area, not just for, not just for the residents of the Bikani First Nation, but also for the surrounding settlers who also uh, started to look at Brockett as being a, a central point for uh, bringing grains to the rail line and also uh, just getting off and on the train at this, uh, at this location. And before long, uh, there was no old agency uh, or there was no agency on the north side of the reserve. Eventually in 1897, Brockett was established as a formal train station. And the train station was given the name Brockett because the governor of the Canadian Pacific Railroad at the time uh, was a Scottish fellow and he named Brockett after one of the uh, buildings on his estate in Scotland. Then that kind of became the hub or the nucleus for the village of Brockett that eventually started to develop. Uh, right up on into, into the early 60s, a lot of Picani people would uh, make money as uh, migrant farm workers. And so they would uh, leave uh, Picani in the summertime, travel into British Columbia and Washington State uh, to pick uh, fruit. I recall when I was a real young fellow, uh, several of my playmates at school would suddenly disappear at the end of, uh, at the, end of the school year. And uh, I wouldn't see them again for the whole summer. And then when I did meet them again in the fall time, They'd be telling me stories about going out to 
Wenatchee, Washington or Creston, BC to pick apples and uh, this was a real uh, big adventure for them. And a lot of them came back, they spent about, you know, oh, month, month up in uh, Walla Walla and places like this. And then they made their round trip back to, um, through Calgary Stampede. <laughs> but everybody looked forward to do, doing that. And that's how independent people were. Uh -huh. You know, they didn't rely on social assistance. There was nothing at the time. And, yeah. you know, they went out and made their money. Sandy Dielison was interested in learning more about the role residential schools played in facilitating the transition to reserve life. Armed with several research questions, Dielison and a team, including Dr. Eldon Yellowhorn, surveyed and excavated sites on the grounds of the former Queen Victoria Jubilee Home for Indian Children, located west of Brockett next to Highway 3. What I'm more interested with this particular uh, part of the project is to see the uh, institutional spaces and how institutional spaces were used uh, in, this, in this particular area. Missionaries had a particular idea of what uh, a farm looked like, what a working farm looked like. And so they went about trying to uh, recreate that farm experience here. Uh, but what I'm interested in finding is whether Bikani people adopted that impression of uh, uh, what an ideal farm looked like and what a working farm looked like. So primarily what I was doing was looking at the daily life of at the residential school. So what were some of the routines that the children had in their daily life? Um, what kinds of things were, were they learning? The Queen Victoria Jubilee Home for Indian Children is no longer standing. In 1896, the school was relocated from the St. Peter's Mission at the mouth of Olson Creek, 16 kilometers upstream, and renamed in honor of Queen Victoria of England's Diamond Jubilee. The school was declared as structurally the best in the diocese by the church mission, and the Department of Indian Affairs asserted that the institution was nearly perfect. To the Bigani, it represented a recognition of treaty promises. Children in the school were aged 6 to 12, and there was an average of 21 students who regularly attended the school. By the mid-1920s, the school had fallen into disrepair and was again relocated and replaced by the St. Cyprian Mission School. As an archaeologist, I was taking a, a different approach in that I was looking, uh, taking an archaeological approach through the lens of the material culture. So what I was doing was looking at the physical evidence of the residential school. And what did that mean for the students that were living there and then the greater community? And also, um, what, what can we as archaeologists learn about residential schools in, by looking at the material culture? How can we contribute to the history of the residential schools? Accessing the documents of the residential schools has become extremely difficult um, because of access to archival information um, and um, archival and government control over the documents. So taking this archaeological approach, we're actually able to go onto the reserve, to go to the site of the residential school, and to look for the archaeological signature of the residential schools. Um, and then we can fill in the gaps that are left by the documents, um, the historical documents about the school. In order to ensure that I also had a First Nations perspective, it was important for me to hear what Aboriginal people had to say about their experience at residential schools firsthand. I attended a number of Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, hearings in which people were able to provide um, testimony about their experiences um, in sort of open circle groups um, that were, were generally open to everyone to share and to listen. The school operated pretty much um, on, on a plan of the children um, having some classroom, acti classroom activity time where they would learn sort of rudimentary reading and writing skills. But primarily um, the time at the school was spent running the school. The children were responsible for all the daily activities of the school. 
they did all the housework, all of the cleaning, all of the cooking, um, and the preparations for the school, and and they did all of the the work outside of the school. But he was more or less like a like a handyman, you know, where he helped in the gardens and horses and everything, things that need to be hauled. They did them. So the main purpose, I think, of the residential schools was to remove Aboriginal tradition and customary practices. Here is a book that it was written um, for people to understand, for farmers and agricultural people, to understand soil chemistry how t and how to grow the best conditions for growing certain crops. And this book was so important um, to the school that the other textbooks that the children normally would have used were thrown out and were replaced by this particular book. We can easily categorize the objects that we find into very functional categories of architecture and education and domestic space, but when we examine them closer and look at the artifacts and consider what our, our oral testimonies have told us, what people's um, experiences have told us about residential schools, they no longer become that simplistic. And then in fact, the objects take on new meaning. And things like um, chalk and slate boards, yes, they def definitely represent education, but for Aboriginal people who attended the residential schools, they also represented taking away of languages. When we did the archaeological excavations, we didn't find any toys at all, um, which is unusual because the school operated for 30 years. Mm -hmm. The archaeological evidence, uh, you know, most archaeologists wouldn't even consider it to be um, exciting archaeology because you are just finding bits of building uh, bits of buildings and and glass and and remnants of uh, you know domestic activities and school activities activities but it's much more it it becomes so much more than that when you link everything together and you're able to tell a complete story and you know sort of reanimate the lives that were going on in the school you know and and how 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 this how residential schooling as a whole impacted children how it impacted their families how it impacted their communities and from his experience he said i stayed here for 13 years he said i learned everything how to be how to be uh how how to survive but not in the proper way but in a more like a criminal sense because he had to experience a lot of um, a lot of things like stealing extra food, you know, which is just to survive. Mm -hmm. him, and, him and my mother, my mother went to the residential school, she was more or less also just, just left there till she was 16. And, and, and she, she stayed there, she went up to I think grade 7 or grade 8. Um, but together they understood that they lost out in life. And that, that loss that they had was, was the educational or, and the well-being of, of them as, as young people. This is one of the, the, the first, uh, perhaps the only attempt to um, excavate a, a residential school in Canada. This is a very um, unique kind of historical archaeology. It is very emotional. It touches on a number of lives um, for people who are who who are living beings, um, and also it impacts um, what they've learned about themselves over the years, how they see themselves as well. And as archaeologists, we want to try and step back from um, you know, from, from, from interfering in any of that process. We want to try and remain neutral as much as possible um, and just to provide the history of the school. However, there is so much opportunity um, to examine the archaeological evidence for, of residential schools and to complete the history so that we can provide a, a, a full and rich history of these schooling.
of this type of schooling for, um, for First Nations communities. Okay, this uh, building is the third of the uh, Anglican uh, schools that were built on the Bikani First Nation. Uh, the original one was at the uh, site of Royal Jubilee Home where we're doing our excavations. But this was a day school. It was, uh, the focus was on uh, instruction. And so there was no need to build dormitories or to have uh, outbuildings that were uh, dedicated to farm work. Rather, this school was all about uh, instruction. Bikani people had been a mobile culture in the old days. And changing to a, a kind of culture where they're living on homesteads and farmsteads, uh, I was interested in, use, uh, in their use of space. Now, uh, how does the uh, allocation of space and domestic spaces around their homesteads and farmsteads uh, correlate with or parallel the old uh, TP days. My research was examining the Bikani uh, during that transition period after the bison had gone extinct when they had when they were forced to make a shift because that's something that's not recorded in, in the ethnographies when the ethnographers were going out in the late 19th and early 20th centuries they weren't interested in how Indians were living at that time. There's been very little uh, archaeological exploration of reserves uh, and at, at, the, at the culture shifts that occurred on the reserves and it was my impression from reading through the ethnographic record and uh, even just talking to different Bikani people that there really wasn't, um, it wasn't an era them that they themselves talked a lot about. They seemed to refer a, a lot to the ethnographic era when talking about identity. But it seems to me that this early reserve era is part of the modern Bikani identity because it's their ancestors, uh, ancestors of those living today um, were forced to make these shifts in a very quick order and I was, uh, I was hopeful that this would be uh, of interest to them, that they'd be interested in this part of their, their history that they didn't seem to be talking much about. There was this notion in the 19th century that civilized people farm. There's a very strong linkage in the ideology between European civilization and farming. And so it was thought if, we, if the Blackfoot were converted into a, farmers that the, this would be a step along the way toward a European style of civilization. Where the Bikani homeland is is not really suitable for agriculture pursuits. By the 1870s and 1880s um, the weather got, the region got drier and so crops weren't doing as well and in fact a lot of settlers in that region uh, left the area for that very reason. They couldn't make a go of it agriculturally. The Nitsitapi didn't have the option of picking up and leaving. The landscape was actually far more suited to ranching than it was farming. And this was also a, voc a vocation that certainly I think Elder Picani would have been more comfortable with. But of course the federal government did not see ranching as um, a good civilizing activity for the Bikani to take on. And so there was this battle really with the uh, Department of Indian Affairs and with Indian agents for at least 15 years where the Indian agents were saying, look, we can make a go of this. We can make a go of ranching. And the government was saying, well, we're not sure we could try it. And they tried it for a year or two and then they went back and said, no, no, we really need you guys to focus more on agriculture. Uh, even though the region was unsuited to agriculture, and then, of course, the government brought in additional rules and regulations saying that uh, Indians couldn't use mechanized farming because this was a problem for the white farmers. The white farmers didn't like this sort of competition. Everybody was a rancher on the reserve here. Everybody had uh, cattle, horses, and they used to really move around on the reserve. Like in the spring, for an example, the first thing we'll do is They'll move out to their farm, see, put a tent there, and bring wood early, and then have a tent there, bring their family there. They'll break land and do all this stuff. Eh? After they've done that, seed, and then they'll move out to Haley, see, and they'll spend the summer there, hay, uh, selling hay to, uh, to uh, provide for their family, see. And then in the fall time, they'll move back to their farms, eh? 
set up that tent, but the old guys used to continue going, uh, take your wives down home along the river. Yeah. And uh, so the harvest is taken off, and then someone will go on to uh, to uh, to timber, say, and they'll log all winter. So everybody had a different way of uh, surviving. Eh? There was no such thing as what you call welfare or anything like that. Eh? So it was, it was, it was a very, very, uh, very good life. Uh, this was one of the first one in, in Canada, maybe I'd say in North America, this uh, dipping vat. Eh? Where they had uh, the steam engines and uh, boiling boil water and stuff like that, and uh, send the cows through it. They never had, they never used vaccine or anything. So the roundup was about 3,500 head of cows in the 50s. Eh? And everybody would come out. Everybody would come out to see their cows, brand their calves, and take part in this, in this roundup here. Uh, it will last about a month. Eh? So I've been here for over 50 years, eh? out here. So it's a good life, you know, it's a good That's why I tell this Willard here, it's, it's never leave. Uh, I always remain 42 years old. <laughs> I'm hitting 70 now. Eh? One of the questions I wanted to explore and wanted to answer was what elements of the ethnographic teepee life persisted once uh, Bigani people adopted this alien vernacular housing. We had uh, Dr. Elton uh, Yellowhorn, he had two older brothers who had lived in this one site as, as children. And so this seemed like a fantastic opportunity to explore this. The, the basic floor, the, the cabin was long since gone. The floorboards were still intact and we had the remembrances of where things were in the cabin. And some of the earliest cabins, um, they didn't have uh, a cement foundation, they were just, they just had a dirt floor. Uh, government agents didn't like this. This was seen as a sign of an unclean home and a civilized home should have a cement foundation with joists on top of it and then uh, a wooden floor. So the earliest houses were these, were these small, small cabins. By about the turn of the 20th century, you start seeing some Bikani people are actually building these frame houses that have multiple, multiple rooms within them. Once Bikani adopted these cabins, um, if they were single room cabins with no internal partitions, they seem to have been continuing to use the space within them as they would within a teepee. Once you have multi-frame houses, you begin to get, um, you begin to lose a bit of that communal uh, lifestyle. The Yellowhorn Homestead is located down in the Old Man River Valley, which has since time immemorial been uh, a wintering ground for uh, Pikani people. For generations they had lived in round uh, grassile teepees and space within those teepees was divided up into male and female areas, into uh, private and public spaces, as well as ritual and non-ritual areas. Once you had the doorway and the hearth fixed in place, all other social activity occurred um, within that within the home in relation to those areas so if you walked in the teepee door immediately to the left would would have been what was considered the woman's area in the home that was where some of the food preparation would be would be done that's where the firewood would be stored and what we see in the yellowhorn homestead uh, is that this pattern continued we know that the firewood was stored immediately uh, to the left of the door and we know that the kitchen was built there and so that aspect would have actually um, reinforce continuity from, from the pre-reserve era. Um, at, opposite the door behind the hearth would be where um, a lot of the ceremonial regalia would be stored. That would be considered a, a sacred area of the teepee. And again, we see in the Yellowhorn homestead that Thomas Yellowhorn, who was an active ritualist in some of the Blackfoot societies, was storing uh, his ceremoni ceremonial regalia within steamer trunks along that north wall opposite the door. The One Owl site was very useful to, in terms of tr trying to imagine what the, what the Yellowhorn site would have looked like. Certainly the construction techniques would have been very similar. They were almost the same size. And that cabin was actually still standing, which allowed us to get at some uh, construction details.
Um, for instance, we know that the we know empirically uh, from observing the chimney hole that the the um, stove was in the center of that house. To me, what the uh, archaeolo archaeological assemblage in conjunction with the uh, oral testimony from Joe and Romeo tell us was that Picani were act actively recontextualizing their lifestyles. They were adopting this, this new material culture, um, but I don't think that simply means assimilation. The Picani were actively adopting elements that they saw as useful to their lifestyle, things that they wanted. Um, Obviously, they liked the radio. I mean, that, that was a big thing in its time. It's kind of sort of like what the internet is today. This was radio, and, and it allowed you to tune in to different places and, and hear new things that you may not have uh, had any access to before. And I think that's a very human thing. Christina Hannes joined Dr. Yellowhorn's project in 2009. Hannes sought to discover how the Bikani's relationship to their landscape was influenced once colonial ideas of land use and land organization dominated the territory. Hannes examined a turn-of-the-century logging operation on Reserve 147B, the Bikani Timber Limit, along with visiting and documenting the last hideout of a legendary Blackfoot warrior named Charcoal. I was really excited to be a part of Eldon Yellowhorn's project surveying the Pecani timber limit um, first because it, it was uh, primarily an un unsurveyed um, portion of the Porcupine Hills which was really exciting to examine um, but also it was great to know that the work we did would enable Pecani people to develop their land and we would be able to uh, protect the archaeological sites we discovered um, and it would enable the Bakani people to take control of their own heritage in this area. 147B is a unique section which provides viewpoints to the Tipi Liner Mountains to the west. The spiritual power of the geographic place is um, evident all around you. Pakani collaborators really uh, impress this upon us. The Bakani Timber Limit was an important place uh, for harvesting timber for the Pakani people uh, prior to the establishments of reserves. And some of those uses continued uh, into the modern era, including um, teepee, teepee poles, poles for travois, and also um, as a special gathering place for, for certain plants and animals that were not available in the rest of the Pakani territory. Prior to the colonial era, Pakani people travel over their landscape, over um, the trails which have been frequented by their ancestors. There was no disconnect between uh, spiritual sustenance and economic sustenance. The life ways of the Pakani people changed in the colonial era when uh, Eastern bureaucrats came in and began to divide up their territory into a grid structure. Uh, fences were built over the traditional Pakani trails, um, forcing them to, to take different routes and their economic systems were uh, impacted. Uh, fortunately, um, the Pakani were able to hold on to the Pakani timber limit as part of the Porcupine Hills. The colonial reorganization of the area that became known as Southern Alberta severely negatively impacted Pakani people. Um, because of the past system, they were forced to stay on one small square block of their territory. The Pakani timber limit is covered with um, evidence of their logging history. When the railway went through the main Pakani reserve, they received uh, a sum of money. With their money from their compensation, they were able to build a sawmill which allowed many Pakani families to build their first frame houses. The policy of the Department of Indian Affairs was not always very clear in providing directions to Indian agents. The Pakani at the turn of the century had a Indian agent uh, who actually listened to them for a short period of time 
and, and that was what really helped them build their sawmill. When new Indian agents came along, uh, they were not as interested in actually assisting the Pakani people with outside pressures from competing sawmills uh, striving to shut it down, they were not able to continue running their mill. If you judge the successfulness of the mill by the number of houses the Pakani people were able to build during that time period, it was quite a successful mill. The Pakani set up their own sawmill during a time period when they were still very much in control of their own destiny. And as bureaucratic forces moved into control more and more of their lives, they were less able to control their own economic futures. In some ways, the case of the Pakani sawmill demonstrates this. They were able to control their own economic futures by demanding their compensation for their land. Many of the workers who worked in their own communally run sawmill eventually turned to wage labor in other logging camps around Alberta. The story of charcoal is an act of the colonial government asserting control over Bakani people and the different ways the story is told really uh, highlight the different understandings of that transition and what it meant. Visiting the archaeological sites associated with these uh, famous narratives like the narrative of charcoal really adds a lot to the experience of the past. It adds a physical realm to his story. Providing the GPS coordinates of the site we found uh, in our survey work to the Pakani Nation will help them protect the site. And it will also help Pakani community members, I hope, to be able to visit the site. Eagle traps that have been previously recorded in Alberta uh, are fairly ambiguous. And many of the eagle traps that are recorded, um, archaeologists have suggested that it may be an eagle trap and it may be something else entirely. The benefit of the eagle trap that we were able to locate in the Porcupine Hills on Pakani Timber Limit 147B is that we believe that it was used into the historic period, um, maybe, possibly even as late as the 1950s. It may be one of the last eagle traps that was in use in Alberta in that, in that time period. The, the area allowed Pakani people to perform this activity, whereas elsewhere they would have been forbidden from doing so because it's a spiritual activity and that uh, was not encouraged. It wasn't until near the end of the project that I finally realized what I'd been learning about. Um, the Pakani relationship with the environment is very different than the white settler relationship with the environment. And you can read about it all you want, but it, it takes someone to actually show you, to really understand. We have such beautiful land in our, you know, in our, on our reserve here. Uh, for instance, look at that buffalo jump up there. And um, these uh, rocks where our ancestors used to live at one time. You know, if you go there, you still see the um, teepee rings and where they camped, you know, and, and the rocks where they, they uh, built to hide behind when the buffalo were coming. You know, you still see that. And um, those things are, I guess, still alive and they'll, they'll always be like myself and anybody else on, on the uh, reserve. You know, we, we treat those places like special places and uh, we're just lucky to have them. In the early reserve era, the Bikani people's worldview was influenced by colonial forces, but not in the way the federal government had hoped. The people appropriated what they saw would fit into their lifestyles at the time items to make life easier, and simple pleasures that assisted in easing the hardships of the era. But all of this foreign material culture was adopted and adapted into an existing cultural framework that has stood the test of time, since time immemorial.